2014-2015 London Welsh side are the worst Premiership team of all time. In terms of pure quality and performance, it's not even a competition. 22 games played, 0 games won, 0 draws, 22 losses. 1 point in the league table, 33 points behind Newcastle Falcons, the team directly above them. They scored just 223 points all season and conceded 1,021 points and had a points difference of negative 798. In comparison, the next worst was 10th place Hunt Irish, who scored 442 points and conceded 578 for a points difference of 136. So, yeah, they are the worst team in terms of on field performance of all time. But they aren't the worst Premiership side of all time. Because in terms of relative performance, while still a disaster, everyone knew they were going to be a disaster because they were forced to compete with teams receiving more than twice the amount from the RFU after they were promoted from the Championship. It is unfair to call them the worst Premiership side in all times in terms of relative performance because the 2021-2022 Bath Rugby side is the worst Premiership team of all time in terms of relative performance. They have absolutely no excuse for their performance that season. They don't have the excuse London Welsh have of having little Premiership experience, little money, little amount of star players, little time to gel. It was simply the culmination of a very slow, self-inflicted gunshot wound that was the Stuart Hooper era. Unlike London Welsh, Bath had everything you need to succeed. Bath have more money than most teams, more financial security, and more resources, more stable leadership. Well, in theory, at least. They had international superstars like Charlie Yules, Sam Underhill and Tulupe Falatau in the pack, Ben Spencer and Danny Cipriani, Jonathan Joseph, Big Joe Fucking Asiga in the back, so you had the likes of Cameron Redpath, Ben Urbano, Anthony Watson, Tom Dunn, and others in the squad, and I'm not just listing names for the sake of listing names or saying that because you have big names in your team you should be successful. I'm saying that all of these players are internationally capped players who weren't out of their prime or anything. Well, except one of them, but were humiliated this season. Yes, they scored significantly more points in that season than London Welsh, getting 34 league points, joint last with Newcastle and one point behind Worcester. Yes, they did indeed win five whole games and achieved one draw. Yes, they had a better points difference than London Welsh, and even Worcester that season, scoring a negative 302, scoring 461 points and conceding 763. But in terms of expectations versus on-field performance, it is undeniable that this Bath side was the worst Premiership team of all time, because Bath had no excuse to perform this poorly, because they had every single advantage that any team could possibly have, and yet were still unbelievably terrible. So, how did Bath get here? Well. It was simply the culmination of the Dark Ages. This is the story of the Stuart Hooper era. In essence, the disastrous 2021-2022 season has its foundations all the way back in the 2018-2019 season. Todd Blackadder's bath were mediocre and it was an open secret he wasn't going to stay at the club for the long term. It was reported that former club captain Stuart Hooper was being groomed as Blackadder's successor, and he would learn that Blackadder inherit the squad at the end of his three years. This obviously set alarm bells off in fans' heads. Hooper wasn't exactly a charismatic figure, but more importantly, he had little coaching experience. I think a suitable comparison can be made with Steve Borthwick, two uncharismatic former bath captains and locks who had spent spells at Saracens who, after retirement, quickly began a coaching career. Borthwick spent many years as the Darth Vader to Eddie Jones Palpatine, becoming his apprentice and developing as an assistant coach 
later a forwards coach, gradually climbing the ladder from Japan to England before finally proving himself as a worthy coach for the Leicester Tigers. And upon taking charge, he slowly rebuilt the club, being given a great deal of control and made them champions once again, and being tipped by many as the man who would one day replace Eddie Jones. It probably happened sooner than anyone would have liked, but nonetheless, a roadmap is here. However, Bath instead went, nah mate, less than three years in the role of performance and player development officer is all you need to run a premiership club. Hooper was obviously grossly underqualified to be director of rugby, and the club put themselves in a corner by preemptively announcing that he'd be taken over from Blackadder after he departed, setting up a semi-long-term roadmap for the future of both the club and Hooper's progression, only for Blackadder to leave one year early, meaning that they were now stuck with Stuart Hooper, who only had very minor coaching experience over a very, very short span of time. What could possibly go wrong? Throwing him in as director of rugby with a team that clearly wasn't gelling very well was one of the biggest hospital passes of all time. His failure was almost inevitable. Upon getting the job, Bath released the following statement. Bath Rugby today confirms the appointment of Stuart Hooper as director of rugby, a role within which he will lead the rugby development within an exciting coaching team at the helm and be charged with driving the club into a period of high performance and success. Hooper's appointment follows a clear process and thought and consideration by Bath Rugby, a process which affirmed the view that he is the right person to lead the club into the future. As director of rugby, Hooper will provide strength, leadership and a clear direction for the coaching team and squad to provide greater consistency and performance to underpin domestic and European success. Well, before I go on, I want to say I don't blame Stuart Hooper for what was about to come. I'm probably the biggest Stuart Hooper defender out there. I think he was put in an impossible position and was grossly underqualified for that position. And because of that, it almost became inevitable that he would be quite a conservative leader. It's no surprise he was a conservative leader because it was a conservative pick for director of rugby. He wouldn't rock the boat, was seemingly the thinking behind it. The only problem being the boat instead sank. Bath's start to the Hooper era was not great. Okay, look, the season was actually pretty positive in some areas. There were warning signs of what was to come, but there was actually genuine high moments in the season. Let's start with the negatives. As a whole, Bath's start of the season was terrible. Bath's start of the season pre-lockdown was actually pretty abysmal. It started with a 43-16 demolition at Bristol, the first Bath game I ever watched by the way, and later in the year the club was hammered 57-20 at Sandy Park. But they also beat Exeter early in the season and had pretty convincing wins over London Irish and Northampton which showed genuine promise. But the way the team played was largely quite dull, not just from a spectator point of view, it was dull because the team lacked structure brought to the side by Ben Spencer when he arrived mid-season. Spencer completely changed the form of Bath season. They completely reinvented the way they played following lockdown, with a side playing with less possession and they started kicking more, they started scoring more and playing with genuine attacking momentum. It was weird. <laughs> it's weird because you wouldn't expect that from this Bath team based on how they played before this and how they would play after this. But ultimately, this was quite a successful season for Bath. They were able to get a place in the playoffs for the first time since the 2014-2015 season. And as a result of going on an impressive win after lockdown, people were really, really hyped for the next season. They had just one defeat after the lockdown restrictions were lifted and it happened against Wasps at home, and they also suffered one draw away from Sar at Saracens, but those are hardly things to be ashamed of considering the overall form of the team. 
and they were able to win the remaining seven matches of the regular season, which in itself is a pretty huge accomplishment. A key difference was not only Spencer's arrival, but also Neil Hatley taking over as the head coach on the Hooper, which saw Bath's forward pack become a lot more threatening and competitive with the big boys in the league. But what I found personally encouraging was the rise of the young, promising stars of the squad, the likes of Tom DeClanville, Cameron Redpath and Miles Reed, who are now Bath mainstays, establishing themselves under Hooper this season. I do think this was cause for optimism, especially after that second half of that season, I do think people had a reason to trust the process here, because it seemed that progress was already being made. But ultimately, if the pandemic hadn't happened and Hatley wasn't promoted when he was, if Spencer hadn't come in as early as he did, and if the season had continued how it started, they wouldn't have been playoff contenders. After round 13, before the lockdown, Bath was 6th with 30 points. 5 points down from 4th place Northampton, and within punching distance of 9th place Gloucester on 26 points. And let's not forget that this was the season Saris had their huge points reduction, so the table was actually even more flattering to Bath, with their relative quality not really reflecting their place on the table. So, while they were able to salvage the season, there were warning signs there, but surely, reaching the top 4 again was absolutely a possibility the next season, especially with a massive contender like Saracens relegated, right? Right? OOPS! This season was rough, like genuinely I know it was the next season where things became comically bad, but this season was just rough. Let's look at the positives, Bath won 10 games out of 22 but two of those wins came because of pandemic-related fixture cancellations, so... But hey, eight on-field wins isn't... I mean, it's it's bad, it's not very good at all, but it's better than the next season. Bath were also able to secure a place in the Champions Cup, somehow. So again, that's good, but yeah, okay, now they're negatives. Bath had one of the worst defences in Europe. It was horrendously bad. Bath conceded 604 points, second only to Wasps, but Wasps at least scored tries and had significantly better points differences than Bath did, with Newcastle and Worcester being the only team's worse points differently than Bath. Points differently? Is that a word? I don't care. Bath season started pretty horrendously. They lost the opening two games to Newcastle Falcons and Exeter Chiefs after picking up a 18-17 win over Newcastle in round 3. Things were seemingly looking up, but Bath had to wait until round 9 for the next win. That is one win in the opening 8 games, which is pretty, pretty abysmal. Bath were going to win the next 7 of their 13 games, which is progress, but it still wasn't especially you know, good, it wasn't like, playoff worthy. Bath finished 7th in this season, but I think this campaign was actually a lot worse than people remember. For starters, as I mentioned, Saracens weren't even in the league, and if they were, Bath probably would have finished 8th. But ignoring that, let's say they didn't get awarded those 2 wins against Gloucester and London Irish, and those cancelled games went ahead. Personally. I think both of these sides were probably the favourites against Bath this season. I honestly think they both would have beaten Bath, especially considering the form that Bath were in at the time these games were to be played. And if that happened, Bath would have finished 11th of 12, barely ahead of a pretty atrocious Worcester team. Let's just say this season was a preview for the year ahead. And here we have it folks, the big daddy, the giant haystacks, the big kahuna burger of bad rugby seasons, the 2021-2022 Bath rugby season. It wasn't just the fact that Bath finished bottom of the table this year, for the first time in their history, it isn't the fact that they won just 5 out of the 24 games, it's not just that, it's the manner of which they lost. They didn't lose with Valor. They didn't try and execute a game plan that was ambitious and just didn't work. It didn't even look like they had a game plan. 
with everyone fully fit at Bath. This season, Bath had 19 players capped internationally in the 15-man code, and others with international sevens experience. But there was a huge injury crisis this season, and that can't be ignored. And bluntly, Bath didn't have the depth outside of their strongest 23 to cover for these injuries and absences, and thus they often struggled. But that isn't the deflection of criticism, it shows a failure in squad management and team building. Modern day rugby isn't won by your strongest 15 or 23 who need squad depth and rotation, which is something Johan van Graan has mastered expertly. You can have Finn Russell take a week off in America and still have a very competitive team that could almost beat Northampton at home. This is how you manage modern rugby. But even when the team was fully fit, the squad looked directionless. Let's look at the most infamous defeat this season, the 64-0 loss away at Gloucester. Bath had 10 players with international experience in their starting lineup, and yet failed to score a single point. This wasn't an isolated incident. This was a repeated pattern, the latest humiliation in a season that saw them lose their opening 12 games straight. The latest humiliation in a season that saw them defeated 71-17 by Saracens at home, as well as an often forgotten 61-19 defeat to Bristol in the Prem Cup, and a 7-64 loss to Leinster at home in the Champions Cup. Not even mentioning big defeats to Exeter, Wasps, Northampton, and Leicester as well. It was a disaster. Bath signed Danny Cipriani this season. I think he had maybe one or two good performances. I think he played well against Bristol, maybe away at Leicester. I think I have like a vague image of him doing something cool. But considering that he was one of the most coveted fly halves in the world for the 2019 Rugby World Cup, his performances at Bath were just all the more uninspired. A halfback pairing between Cipriani and Spencer does seem odd in concept. They seem like two very different types of players who wouldn't necessarily work well together, but it wasn't like this pairing failed to click on an experimental game plan. Again, it was like there wasn't a game plan. With two international halfbacks, who between them have won four European Champions Cups, it should have been at least interesting. But it wasn't. He offered nothing as an attacking pairing, whereas Spencer and Russell have already established themselves as a formidable duo at the time of writing, partly because they have a game plan seemingly designed around them in attack, rather than an uninspired attack, with two players who just happen to be called Ben Spencer and Danny Cipriani at the helm. And that's how I would best describe Bath this season, a squad of individuals. If this was a team, it was a team without a soul, empty husks of players failing to execute a game plan that didn't suit their styles, that doesn't even seem to have an internal logic or tactical direction. I don't blame Hooper or the players necessarily, I feel like the coaches were limited by a meddling group of higher ups on signings and player selections, and because of, again, Hooper's inexperience he wasn't really able to navigate around this. And I feel like there's a deep lack of leadership in the squad. I do feel like Cooper was merely a puppet for Bruce Craig. For years, there's been rumours that he has over-exercised his authority to influence signings and squad selections and training practices and blah blah blah. And it almost felt like Cooper was put in as a yes man for that role because if you think about it, the signings and squad selections doesn't really make sense. These are all incredible players, but they don't mesh as a team. Because you look at Danny Sibiani and you ask, why did they sign him? He'd been out of form for almost the entirety of his last season at Gloucester. He was getting a bit old. He clearly didn't have a lot left in the tank. It was a big money signing. It just felt like the club wanted a name. They wanted a superstar. And Bath was a squad of big names, but they weren't a team. It's like Soup Cipriani was brought in because of his name, but he didn't fit in the spa structure at all, because there wasn't a coherent one. So these big name players just became another face that failed to execute a poor game plan. That's why when Nathan Hughes came in on loan from Bristol, he felt huge. He 
who has motivated a lightning bolt of energy, who reinvigorated all of those around him mid-season and almost single-handedly carried Bath to a shock win on debut against Harlequins. But I imagine if he stayed, his impact would fall more and more as he just became another individual who happened to wear a Bath shirt, rather than a valuable member of the United team. Another thing I want to discuss is the leadership failures in this era. Freddie Burns and Anthony Watson have gone on record about how the departures from the club were handled, and with Watson specifically describing how the higher-ups basically ignored him for months, and they told him they wanted to resign him, but days before the deal was done, they just pulled the offer off the table, over the phone, no explanation, no dignity, it just displays failure in leadership. But a real catastrophe can be seen with the Ed Griffith saga at the club. Let me just sum some of it up with some small sections from an article about his power struggle with Stuart Hooper and his departure. <clears throat> a flashpoint between Hooper and Griffiths occurred when Bath's season was all but over with one last shot at redemption in the Challenge Cup. To prepare for their last 16 tie against Edinburgh, Bath have penciled in a foreign training cap. Yet, as the camp approached, the details changed significantly, allegedly at the behest of Chairman Griffiths. Rather than train in Portugal, the squad would head into Marseille, the host city of the European finals, on a team bonding trip, and the coaching staff were not, initially, invited along for the ride. Whether this was by accident or design, it is not clear. Even when the coaches arrived in France, some were in different hotels to the rest of the squad. When he found out, Director of Rugby Hooper is understood to have had, had a heated discussion with Griffiths. Hooper and Griffiths' roles overlapping reportedly led to friction, take recruitment and contract negotiations. At the start of December, Hooper believed, is believed to have informed England international Jonathan Joseph that he would not be retained when his contract expired at the end of the season. Yet last month, it was officially announced that Joseph's contract was being extended. Meanwhile, Hooper had lined up a deal to bring in second row Ben Scragg from Cornish Pirates, only for Griffiths to abandon the agreement. Scragg is now understood to be signing for London Irish. Pierce Francis is a rival at the club, and signed from Northampton, only for him to discover that he was playing as a fly half option rather than the centre he was playing for nearly his entire career at Franklin's Gardens. Meanwhile, Bath are losing both of their test alliance in wing Anthony Knutson and number 8 to Lupe Falatel. Seven signings are set to join the season at Farley House, although how many of those new recruits when negotiations occur by Griffins or Hooper remains unclear. Many internal observers felt Hooper had been undermined and sidelined since Griffin's arrival. Aside from Marseille, there have been several occasions that Hooper was left out of the loop on squad gatherings. Is it any wonder why this team was an abject failure? Divided behind the scenes, divided coaches, divided players, a proud club brought to its knees through failure. When Johan van Graan joined Bath, I was absolutely ecstatic. Even though most Monster fans weren't huge fans of his by the end of his reign, under his leadership they were extremely competitive. During his time with Monster, Van Grand's teams regularly pushed towards the latter stages of competitions, but they weren't a threat to the top teams necessarily, and they were that was largely due to the fact that they failed to adapt when their game plan wasn't working. But regardless, when it works, they were a very good team, and Johan Van Grand is a very experienced coach, and I think since joining Bath he's done a better job at adapting his game plan to circumstances that don't necessarily fit it. When he joined the club, he described it as a train journey over multiple years, and each year he wanted distinct improvement. With the goal of year one being getting hard to beat, which wasn't exactly something to get the fans heartbeats up, but it was needed and pretty safe to say was accomplished. Although it took a while, Bath did become very hard to beat throughout the course of that season. Bath lost 12 big games that season, but 7 of those losses came within 7 points. Bath were one of the only 4 teams to have not lost a game by more than 21 points which is a pretty huge improvement from the enormous blowouts the previous year. So, Johan van Grand undoubtedly succeeded in his mission statement of making Bath hard to beat in his first season. Although it took a while, Bath also did start picking up big wins. 
And these weren't even what you could call fluke wins either, these were wins that were accomplished through the success of the game plan, through strong planning and execution. They secured four bonus point wins in a row at the end of the season over Exeter Chiefs at home, Gloucester away, Quinns at Twickenham and Sarries at home. And this wasn't because of a huge overhaul in the game plan, they just executed Johan van Grun's game plan more successfully because of the fact they had built as a team together. They weren't just a team of individuals anymore, they were a unified squad executing the vision of a very pragmatic and experienced leader. I don't want to attribute too much success to personalities, but I think it's at least worth analysing and mentioning a little bit. Because I think since joining Bath, everyone has kind of loved Johan van Grand's attitude. Johan is at times inspirational, he's articulate, he's methodical and careful with his words, and he speaks with confidence and conviction. He can tell the players respect him and want to play for him. Hooper had the leadership qualities of Liz Truss. Now look, I know we can't see everything that happens behind the scenes, but I think all the stories about how he was constantly undermined by everyone around him, and then I see this clip. I'm just going to do the, uh, the debut jerseys today. Uh, as ever, most track player today is Samosa. Um, <laughs> round of applause, very good, very good. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, we've got uh, Ewan. What up, mate? Second, uh, we have uh, Tian. Where are you, bud? Congratulations. And last, uh, but definitely not least, the horse. <laughs> and then I think about what Johan van Grand told the Bath players upon the collapse of Worcester and how he was able to inspire them. And I'm just wondering for Johan van Graan and JP Ferreira, not only are they trying to integrate themselves into Bath as new arrivals, but they're, they're integrating these players who have come from this kind of troubled start to the season. Not, not easy for them. How have they handled it all, do you think? Yeah, not easy, but by all accounts, they've been brilliant. I mean, Jan van Graan has nothing but good things to say. He spoke about a South African saying which he thought was relevant to the situation when they arrived. Um, he said, I, I cried because I had no shoes until I saw a man who had no feet, which he believed was relevant because the idea was that he was asking his, his bar squad, that the players that were there before they arrived, to kind of have a think about how it would be to be in the shoes of the Worcester players. It could have been them, was the message. Imagine a world without rugby when your contract has just been terminated in a hurry. Picture that scene. And I think as a result of that, their presence, their mere presence has really galvanized his side. It's been a bit of a reality, do a reality dose. It's, it's uh, very noticeable that they've got a great sense of gratitude at what they have, the opportunity they've been given here. And I think it's put a bit of rocket fuel in the squad. The Worcester boys' drive is now everybody else's drive also. And when I see that, I think that's a leader. I don't know why, but that has always stuck with me throughout the last year or so. But another example to highlight what I appreciate about Johan is that he is honest and open. I recommend everyone listens to Season 6, Episode 3 of the Bath Rugby Plug. This is a very good podcast with Johan Van Groen on as a guest. The way he talks about the club when he arrived is fascinating. It's so incredibly open. He describes viscerally a broken club with no motivation and a failed culture that, in his own words, was clinging to success 25 years ago. It just highlights how huge the improvements he's made are and how much the culture of the club has changed so quickly. The club are clearly backing him with big signings, which can be seen with the appointment of Finn Russell. I mentioned earlier that Bath are sometimes tending to sign players with big name values only for them to not play at their best or in a style that doesn't necessarily suit them, and I mentioned how Bath should focus on signing the right players, not necessarily just the quote-unquote best players, and there was a worry that when Finn signed that he was just after a million pound a year payday and that he just wouldn't click with Johan's style, but from what we have seen so far and from this season that couldn't be further from the truth. He has fitted in with the squad perfectly. It's not just him being a one-man band, a one-man show carrying Bath to success. He's just been pulling the strings of a firing Bath attack. 
he elevates those around him and he doesn't take away from the game plan, rather he enhances it. It has been a great signing, and at the time of writing we're a third of the way through the season and Bath are sitting pretty in second in the league. Bath isn't necessarily back to its glory days, but they've been playing their best rugby in years and there's a clear belief in this squad that this season they could finally achieve something special. In conclusion, the Stuart Hooper era at Bath Rugby from 2019 to 2022 will be remembered as a dark chapter in the club's history. The initial decision to put Point Hooper as director of rugby, despite his lack of coaching experience, set the stage for a series of disappointments and failures. The prelude to this error highlighted the questionable decision making with Hooper inheriting a team that lacks direction and cohesion. The first season under Hooper showed glimpses of promises, especially with the influence of key players like Ben Spencer and the rise of young talents. However, it was clear that the team had its shortcomings and was heavily reliant on a few certain individuals. The following season, despite securing a Champions Cup place, it exposed the team's defensive vulnerabilities and hinted at the challenges ahead. The 2021-2022 season marked the lowest point as Bath Rugby, despite having a squad filled with international stars, finished bottom of the Premiership table. The lack of a coherent game plan, a seemingly divided team, and leadership failures behind the scenes all contributed to an embarrassing season. The addition of Danny Cipriani did little to improve the team's performances, and injuries further highlighted the lack of depth and planning. The departure of Stuart Hooper and the arrival of Johan van Graan marked a turning point for Bath Rugby. Van Graan's leadership, experience, and strategic approach brought a positive shift. The team became hard to beat, showed improvement in execution, and started playing as a cohesive unit. The contrast in leadership styles between Hooper and van Graan became evident, the latter installing confidence and belief into the squad. The new era under Johan van Graan has brought renewed hope to Bath Rugby. The team is now characterised by a unified squad, a scouted and exciting and cleared game plan, and benefiting from the addition of key players like Finn Russell. Van Graan's honesty, openness and ability to inspire have revitalised the club's culture and created a sense of optimism among players and fans alike. While Bath Rugby may not have fully returned to its glory days, signs of improvement and belief in achieving something more special are evident. The Johan van Graan era represents a fresh start for Bath Rugby, leaving the dark ages of the Stuart Hooper era behind and looking forward to a brighter future. I hope nobody's takeaway from this video has been that I hate Stuart Hooper or have some kind of personal vendetta against him. I don't even blame him for most of the problems, really. I blame the higher-ups, I blame Bruce Clary, I bring the, the bean counters who picked him for the role just out of a conservative idea of having more control over the squad and signings. I think he wasn't necessarily to blame. I think I don't want to personally lambast him or give him all the blame for either his failure in leadership or the failure of the squad. I just don't think he was the right man for the job. And I really do have faith in Johan van Graan. I'm not just a Johan van Graan fanboy. I think he does have his problems as a coach and that can be evident through some of his performances at Munster. But I think he is a really, really strong leader. I think he's a really capable coach. There's a reason why South Africa are seemingly desperate to have him back. And I really, really am optimistic for the future under Johan or under any successor. I think that the future of Bath Rugby can be really bright. Thank you for watching. Please like this video if you liked it, share it if you want to share it, and subscribe for more rugby related content. This has been Rugby Recitation, and I'll see you next time.